Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Amplify Your Business. I am joined by Ken Bautista. He is the co-founder of the Public Food Hub, as well as partner and founder of MakeSpace. Welcome to the show today, Ken. Awesome. Thanks for having me. So, Ken, we have known each other for probably close to a decade or so. You are just a pillar of the entrepreneurial entrepreneurial community here in Edmonton. You are a serial entrepreneur yourself. You're doing so many great and amazing things that are supporting entrepreneurs. I, I'm just really excited to dig into a bunch of things with regard to entrepreneurship in your journey. So thank you so much for taking the time today to join us. The first question I always ask everybody, though, and you don't get to escape this, that is what are three things that every entrepreneur needs to know. And I know your list is going to be massively long because you have so much experience in this and you've worked with so many entrepreneurs. But if you can zero it down to the top three things that every entrepreneur needs to know, what do you think those would be? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's always a great question. And I actually do have three, like three things. Um, oh, wow. That I often, <laughs> there's like three themes that I often sort of talk about, like to other founders and entrepreneurs. Um, they're really like the, the, the traits or what you sort of need to um, uh, know about sort of being an entrepreneur. I think the first one is really about, um, you know, entrepreneurs are uh, relentless and resilient. I think that yeah. is a big part of, you know, entrepreneurship is is really, really hard. You know, one day it's like going like this, like literally like that afternoon, it might go like this. And then you're just constantly sort of like battling this. And, and I yeah. think, you know, um, entrepreneurship is something that you don't just sort of pick up like overnight necessarily too. You learn how to sort of deal with those sort of highs and lows um, and how you really react to that. Um, and so, you know, I think resilience again is, is, is one of those biggest pieces and having that relentless, that relentlessness to just keep pushing forward, trying new things, killing something if it doesn't work um, and, you know, not worrying about looking at the past too, too much, but being able to be like, what did I learn from that experience and apply it going forward? So, so that's, the first one. Number two is I think entrepreneurship is, is understanding that you always are balancing this world of uh, having hope and understanding the math. Um, and cause you know, uh, sometimes there's the, you know, you have the vision and you're trying to sort of figure it out and you, you want to believe that something's going to happen. Um, but then there's also some of the, the reality of, of, you know, the math and the data that you need to sort of balance some of that hope out. So you're not just blindly always sort of going um, I think each opportunity an entrepreneur faces is some balance of those two things. Um, and I think the the best entrepreneurs are the ones that can really sort of, you know, know when to like lean on one side versus the other or sort of like have them in sync. Okay. Um, so that's the second one. And then the third one to me, and you know this, I'll, I often talk about, I think uh, entrepreneurship is a really hard and potentially a lonely thing for a lot of people because you're, you know, working, working alone, or maybe you have a co-founder, but you're just trying to figure these things out. And I think the, the biggest value for a lot of entrepreneurs is community. Mm. Um, and I think just being able to be around other people that are going through the process. Um, I'm a big believer in peer mentorship, right? Yeah. So not just necessarily hearing from the people that have like been there, done that, um, you know, the world is changing faster and faster. Right. And so even what, we learned when we first started our companies, like, you know, years back, like we're always like applying what we've learned in those sort of things to, you know, the sort of new era of building a company for, you know, the next five years type of stuff. So I tend to go in kind of like five year, five year bursts um, and sort of say, Hey, there's a problem to solve here. What can I kind of like grow to sort of like solve that problem? Um, but then having a great community that's always evolving around you to sort of like go through that process. Yeah. Yeah. So it's no surprise the community is on your list for sure, because I mean, you are such a big builder of communities as well. So that's really cool. The one that I would love to dig into a little bit more, though, um, is the balancing hope and understanding the cash uh, flow or the math part of it, right? That is one that is, I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't really understand 
that interchange, right? Or the the connection between the two of them. Like you said, every entrepreneur has a need to have the hope and and they have the dreams and everything else, but you have to match it up with the with the math part of it. Yeah. And that's the tricky part is getting that alignment. So uh so yeah, is that something that uh you you know, have any particular advice on that you could uh, share with anybody in your experiences or with some of the businesses that you've interacted with um, as to how to do that well? Totally. Um, So I often have this this slide that I use, which is basically a Venn diagram of hope and math. And in the middle there is kind of like, you know, the sweet spot of of trying to balance that. Um, The biggest thing around that, that math and data piece is, you know, it really informs, you know, I think entrepreneurship is very much about Decision making, um, and so you know, and being informed with making a call and going on a path um, when you may have twenty percent of the data, or maybe you have eighty percent of the data, um, and you have you know, I think entrepreneurs have the confidence to make calls based on less data because they've also sort of tuned, you know, what might happen, or you're starting to anticipate kind of like what things are there. And then also start prioritizing, like, what are the signals that are bad versus, you know, like good, right? And so it, you can look at, you know, take a balance sheet or, a, you know, or a PL and sort of see what's the forecast that's sort of happening. Um, but sometimes it's just numbers, right? It's, but it's really about sort of starting to sort of spot patterns and anticipating where it's going to go. And that's what, that's what we sort of have to figure out. And the hope part kind of comes in to help also, you know, not just be just data driven, but to believe that, hey, there's a why behind what we're trying to do as well. And so that also sort of like adds to that, to that mix for, you know, how the entrepreneur's brain sort of needs to work. So now let's get into what the public food hub is. So this is something that uh, is one of your most recent passions or projects um, or businesses. I'm not too sure exactly how you want to frame it because it's also part of a broader, um, you know, business of yours, the um, uh, make space. And so first tell me a little bit about the problem that the public food hub is trying to solve. And then let's talk about the broader uh, journey that you're on right now with uh, make space. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, You know, the public kind of came a little bit from uh, a couple of things. So, you know, my, my co-founders, um, you know, uh, so Tim came from um, building Booster Juice Up um, and sort of leading their growth from, you know, 99 stars to like 350 uh, uh, worldwide and sort of taking an Edmonton brand and being able to sort of build it that way. And then Kirsta, who, you know, really spent the last like 10 years building um, uh, uh, farmer's markets and weekly markets and, you know, just sort of seeing how do you, how do like lo- local food makers and local neighborhoods really get that sort of value in terms of that connection between, you know, the food maker and the food lover. Um, and then for me, working on Startup Edmonton, you know, we would see a lot of people look at, hey, could you do Startup Edmonton but for food companies because they need more than just internet and desks. They need maybe access to kitchens or they're building yeah. a physical product and their barriers are, you know, you can't just beam the food over the internet, um, yeah. you, but you need to be able to sort of like build a brand and do those things. So we kind of took all of those things together and that's really where the public kind of, you know, really sort of started to form from. Um, we had started the sort of the initial um, version of it around building a space in downtown Edmonton. So just behind McEwen University, um, you know, which was sort of built to have some commercial kitchens, some just like, again, community hub kind of space. Yep. Um, then we ran into COVID, um, you know, and then it was a little bit of a, hey, we can't like get spaces up and running, but maybe that's not necessarily what we needed to do right off the bat too. And one of the things that we started to find was, you know, we can help local makers get up and running, but the biggest value we can do is maybe help them find that customer that might be out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and that customer might not necessarily be local for them too. And so the the idea for the public as more of this sort of marketplace and location network, which we use, you know, kitchens, markets, and, you know, retail outposts um, as a way to help the um food lover get the brands that they want, but closer to home. So instead of them wanting to come downtown for, you know, a 30, 40 minute commute to find their favorite restaurants or their favorite brands, um, more and more people want something that's sort of closer to home. Um, They don't necessarily need it delivered directly to home because some people do want to get out of their house. So that idea of, you know, a sort of small food hub 
but that's in their neighborhood. You know, how could we sort of provide a place like that and then create a network of places where that could be that could be accessed? Yeah. And so then these food hubs then that are distributed out from maybe the downtown center, where like are these commercial kitchens or uh, like what is the the makeup of these food hubs? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, it's been interesting having sort of worked on like building out physical spaces because, you know, you can only do one or they're really hard to do because, you know, requires a lot of capital, sign big leases, you know, and then you're sort of trying to bring everything to sort of happen there. In the distributed model, what we were sort of challenged with was there's actually quite a bit of underutilized spaces out there. And so could we bring some of the uses through the public into, you know, an underutilized um, kitchen space? Uh, or maybe there's a, a, a retail space that's maybe looking to add food into their mix. Or, you know, we work with a, with a bakery in St. Albert and, and, you know, she only bakes two times a week. Um, and then the rest of the time, like, um, she's got some really great space where we can host like tasting classes. We could do drop off programs. Um, but then we're creating that type of use for the people who live five to 10 minutes away from, from her location. So our growth plan around the public is really um, growth through other location partners spaces but to the end customer they know that that's a public powered space yeah yeah and so the maker then is still making it in their own commercial kitchen and they're just drop shipping it into these different places around the city then is the idea right that's right that's right yeah and what what i think is interesting is you know we we always will have this sort of hub and spoke model in each city because you in every city you need a place or a couple of spaces to make them. So, you know, one of the things that makers, you know, grow from making it in their, in their home to then needing maybe a commercial kitchen. But we found that in, in, so in Edmonton, we're actually building one of those in other cities across the country, you know, we're just partnering with the people who have already built some of those homes. And so then our focus is, you know, again, creating those neighborhood outposts that can kind of make use of that hub. Yeah. What I think becomes really interesting is when you start to kind of cross provinces or sort of jurisdictions, because there's a lot of, you know, compliance regulation, a lot of things that you sort of run into in terms of where you make the food and who Mm -hmm. who you can sell it to. Um, The reality is, is that there's always a customer out there who wants the brand or the product that you're making. And, and so, you know, the path for a food maker isn't just always like mass market or, you know, get onto the grocery shelves of the largest grocery chain or to build all the restaurants. Right. But it's to find, you know, the thousands of customers that might be out there that really want what you're making. And now you have some distributed infrastructure or sort of spaces that you can use to not only produce that stuff, but also to sort of sell it in some of these different jurisdictions. So that's really the, the, the vision that we, that we have here in terms of trying to solve that problem for um, the food lover trying to access this stuff, but also to the food maker who's trying to reach them. Yeah, which sort of sounds simple, but it's it's super complicated because you're talking about, you know, infrastructure, location, you're talking about uh, the communication aspects of it. Is it a centralized like ordering application or something or how does that work is, as well? Yeah, so I mean, the at its core, it's a, it's a marketplace like an Etsy marketplace. So it sort of starts mm-hmm. with that online. You can then, um, you know, and then as we have more locations start to come online, they become, you know, either drop-off points, experience points, um, you know, places where we can, you know, pop a a food maker into to host something um, and to make that as easy as, you know, if you look at Airbnb and, you know, and some of these other sort of platforms who work with a location owner to give them the tools to create more value from their locations for a particular user. So that's, that's kind of what would be, what we've been building. Well, that was the analogy that I was thinking of as well with the experiences, because when Airbnb made that migration into offering experiences besides just stays, um, that that was really a fascinating shift. And you guys have that built into the program right to begin with. And so having the ability to, to unleash locations for experiences to happen, but then also the experts, the people who are the thought leaders within those spaces to be able to do um, some really cool experiences for their customers. And that's really, really interesting and intriguing. Yeah, no, totally. And and I think that that's where, you know, when you're doing a two-sided marketplace, you kind of have to focus on one versus the other. You know, yeah. we had very much come from the 
the maker entrepreneur side, because, you know, that's sort of what we know, you know, we've grown that now to about 600 or so sort of makers and brands predominantly in, in Alberta. And so we also know that in every city, there are like, like lots of people out there, and lots of just really interesting makers and products that are being created. The, the biggest challenge is just, again, how do you find the audience that wants that specific thing? So, yeah. you know, I often use this analogy for co- like content creators. So as a content creator, you know, yeah, you can sort of, you know, create a, a channel on YouTube or you can, you know, use Twitch and you can just find your audience that's out there somewhere that wants whatever you're talking about. Yeah. So in the world of food, we think that that's, that, that that's also there in terms of, you know, someone that's looking for, you know, making that connection with that food maker but the food maker is very limited in terms of how they get what they do to that, to that end customer. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it almost democratizes the, uh, the, the connection, right. It allows people to be able to make these broader connections, uh, really meaningful, meaningful connections as well, uh, where the, it would have been so difficult for those makers to be able to do that, to reach beyond just their little neighborhood that they're currently operating within without franchising out or without, um, making, you know, multiple locations themselves, which have their own, huge overheads and challenges as well. So this is a way for them to do that um, and piggyback off of the infrastructure that you guys are creating then, right? Yeah. And and we saw that a lot during the, the pandemic, which is interesting, right? Yeah. So a lot of these, you know, restaurants had to diversify what they're doing. So all of a sudden, you know, some of them are creating subscription programs or their own delivery yeah. services. And yeah. then they're sort of trying to figure out the entire thing. Yeah. Um, for some of them, it was just like, Hey, we're only doing this until we can like open the doors again and go back to our bums and seats model. But for others, it's really like, well, this is actually the future, which is we're building a brand and there's different ways of what we create can, you know, sort of what that customer is sort of looking for. So maybe we need to not just try to build it all ourselves, but can we, you know, work with groups like the public? And, you know, we also work with other, you know, technology and platform partners, you know, to be like, hey, well, we don't have to figure out all the delivery stuff. You know, there are services that we could just integrate with um, to to be able to, you know, make that happen. Um, So so I think that that's there is that new mindset, I think, for food makers. And this goes back to that idea of, you know, again, entrepreneurship and that mindset. And so that piece is in terms of like where where are things kind of going? You can't just rely on being a local food brand anymore and and thinking that the customer is just like i love local and you know what local means is very different for some people too in terms of is it ingredients is it the person is it where it's made um and we also how we buy and access food is very different right like we get subscription stuff we get things we get meal kits we still go to restaurants <laughs> we still go to the grocery store you know and, but that's basically our our food stack in our house, household, which has, you know, really evolved quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. And that's an interesting point that you make about the food stack. It's just really evolving. It's uh, it's much more complicated now, isn't it? Than what it yeah. ever was in terms of complication, in terms of options and in terms of all the different things that one is doing in, uh, with regard to food. But uh, where, yeah, at one point it was just go to the grocery store. I grew up in a, in a, a very, very small community. We didn't have a restaurant in our community. And so right. it was all, everything was, was made at home. So we had one option and that was the grocery store to get your food. Um, and I make it at home. And then, then I moved into a, a, a small town and that small town then had some restaurants and, and then now here I'm in the city where you have all of that. But then now on top of that, you have all these other different options in terms of, of food. Yeah. It's really interesting. Exactly. I never thought about it that way. Well, and, and like, you know, like my parents discovered like things like Instacart during the pandemic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. And so, you know, and I think that if you're in sort of smaller centers, like a lot of our customer base is actually on the outskirts of Edmonton, right? Because it's really about micro neighborhoods, you know, and sort of like these other communities. And so the, the problem to solve was just how do you get the stuff out to them? Yeah. Right. And now we have next day delivery, we can batch stuff, right? Like we can, again, partner with other groups. So the ability to get what you want is there now. Yeah. And it's just going to get even better and better. And so I think what now starts to happen is you also don't want food to just become a very transactional thing, right? I mean, 
how often does it start now when we're like, hey, what should we order on, you know, Skip or Uber once a week? And it's just the same old stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so you, people want to have now variety and sort of choice and they don't want to be limited by, you know, this the one platform that allows that to happen. Yeah. Yeah. And what I really like about what you're creating here is that it's not meant to replace anything, really. It's meant to augment and supplement, right? Which is which is really fascinating because there's so many businesses that are born out of okay, well, there's a problem here. The system's broken. We need to, you know, find a different solution to this. And you guys are like, well, it's not necessarily that. It's just that there is now a different kind of desire or need amongst the population. And so, and then also a challenge that the food makers have. And so let's find a solution that's going to supplement that's going to plug in another option. I like it. Yeah. yeah. Now, how does uh, the public food hub uh, fit into the broader uh, make space uh, business that you have initiative that you have going on as well? Yeah. So, um, you know, building make space really kind of came out of, you know, I just finished startup Edmonton. Um, you know, we'd done the deal with Edmonton economic development. And so, so spent some time around like, you know, ramping up the ecosystem around innovation, entrepreneurship, looking at, you know, we had like the research park, tech Edmonton, like, so you had sort of all of this innovation infrastructure across the community. Um, and one of the things was often in cities, it's being led by um, the sort of the municipality or sort of like the government side and or the, ins- the institutional side. And I think really where it starts to kind of work is when you have that nice balance of public and private, you know, investment in entrepreneurship and innovation ecosystem pieces, especially mm-hmm. when it comes to like infrastructure and place and space. Um, because I think, you know, when you sort of build something, you know, to me, the customer is always like, who's the user of the space? And that's the entrepreneur <laughs> or the companies. Um, but how do you build these sort of spaces? And so, you know, make creating make space was a way to become a development company on the private side. Um, and what we do is we work with, um, you know, landowners or building owners. Sometimes it's municipalities. Um, sometimes it's private owners um, and who come to us and sort of say, hey, we want to build you know, kind of start a startup Edmonton esque space, a space like the public that's for food makers, maker spaces. You know, we're doing a, a project in, in Winnipeg that's all around you know, cybersecurity. And but they all have these sort of common themes, which is, you know, creators and founders and entrepreneurs, um, community spaces and being these sort of hubs um, and, and, and being a, um, you know, platform for those places to be connected to other, you know, um, uh, parts of the network or other sort of like locations. So the public, you know, is our food focused brand um, that's in the family because every single one of these projects that we have been working on, they always have food, you know, uh, food is a way is a great way to just gather people, you know, people always need to eat. <laughs> um, and, and I'm really interested in this intersection of like food and startup communities in places too. Yeah. Um, one of the best startup weeks I went to was in Minneapolis. Um, and so during their tech startup week it is also their food week. And so you get this really interesting, again, being like where that sort of food community goes, like, you know, your sort of tech and startup community also, because those are the places where they eat and gather. And so you want to have that sort of interconnection that's there. Yeah. I, I can, can uh, agree with you more. I love the intersection of food into anything whether that's you know personal life or professional life it's just when you can gather around food and drink right good things happen and i think it's just a it's innately in us i think that uh, uh something that goes back to our caveman days of just yeah. you rapidly build trust when you're breaking bread with somebody across the table from you right exactly. uh, so it's really fun so uh one thing that uh i I've always noticed about you, whenever I bump into you out and about, you're always super positive. You always have something going on, some new idea, something that you're working on. Um, And you're always like just really boosting, you know, entrepreneurialism and and, uh, small businesses and the startup community and so on. Where do you find this limitless, uh, I guess, energy? And then what inspires you as well? I'm really curious where you get your inspiration. Yeah. Well, you know, I think it, it, if I, if I look back, like when I, when I started my first, my first company, cause my, so I graduated from the U of A with a degree in, in education in elementary education. So I was oh, going to be a teacher. 
Mm-hmm. And, um, but my focus was on using technology in the classroom. And so then I was like, oh, what's this like internet thing? And, you know, you, so some of my sort of school projects turned into commercial projects with sort of companies. And, you know, then I was like, oh, okay. Um, you know, my father was a, as an engineer and my mom was a teacher, you know, so, so entrepreneurship and sort of starting a business wasn't necessarily part of what we did either. Um, so figuring out how to sort of start those initial things led me to just being around other people um, who were also sort of building businesses and sort of finding that sort of place or that kind of community. Um, so my, my very first incubator that I started in was in St. Albert um, and it was called the St. Albert Business Development Center or now it's, it's now NABI. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it was there that I, like I was 20, 21 at the time. And so, you know, you're around other people who like, I think we were the only tech company in there too. And so we were around, you know, like, like florists and construction and consulting and engineering and, but just like people that were just building something. Um, And I've always sort of like looked at um, place and space. And I think this is where the teacher side kind of comes in. Even when I think about startup Edmonton, I always thought of it more as a school for founders than an incubator, because, you know, as a, as a teacher, like your job is to sort of create the environment and the conditions where people can, where kids can come in and discover, learn, figure things out, you know, build social skills and all of those things. And, and I think that those themes have always sort of come through anything that I've worked on. Um, selfishly, it's because I just really like learning from other people and sort of getting to know sort of other people. And I think the second side is I also believe that, you know, I think entrepreneurs can come from anywhere. And so getting judged for what you're working on or the scale of what you're working on, you know, like there's always sort of someone out there that sort of sees value in that. So, you know, I think my job is to help people find more of that and stay in that headspace. Um, There is sometimes, especially now when you look at sort of, you know, social and what it means, you know, what entrepreneur life is all about. There's a very painted picture in terms of like, well, you need to be a hundred million dollar company or you need to be hustling like this, you know, and if not, you're not an entrepreneur kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and I, I look at like, look, I think entrepreneurs are just really great builders and problem solvers. Um, And the ones that make it work is the ones that also connect with, who their customer and user is. And you start to start with that. And then maybe that turns into a big company. Maybe it turns into a really great event series that now people sort of saw value out of. Um, and, you know, how do we kind of keep our communities and our cities always having that type of um, mentality and opportunity for, for the people that are trying to build something there? Yeah. 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 It's, uh, it's just fascinating. I think the whole ecosystem, right. And so you've been at all these different stages. I didn't know the background on the teaching side of things, but that really starts to click in. Like it makes sense when I think about what you were creating over there at startup Edmonton, right. It's just, yeah, that totally makes sense. It's a learning environment for entrepreneurs and and you really did create that. That's really cool. So I I'm really uh, interested in you know, you've been in this world for a long time. I think you said before we started to hit the record button that, you, you know, like seven, like official kind of businesses you've been involved with uh, as, uh, you know, starting and, and creating and so on. But you've obviously brushed up against and really helped support and nurture a lot of other businesses through a lot of the businesses that you uh, have had, especially the one that you have right now, right, with MakeSpace. You're working with a lot of different different uh, entrepreneurs. So I'm curious, with all of that history that you have, all that experience, what's easier for you now than what it would have been, say, in the earlier days of your entrepreneurial journey yourself? I think the sort of speaks to that, that all of the three things I sort of said at the beginning around, you know, the the hope of math, the sort of the signal versus I understand. And then the resiliency sort of piece. Yeah. Yeah. Because you just gain a lot more confidence over the year, you know, in, in mm-hmm. over the years with each one, because there's been like, you know, for every something that was just like, you know, successful, <laughs> there was like a lot of stuff that didn't work, you know, but you look at it, be like, well, it didn't work. We didn't like fail hard. Or sometimes it was just like, okay, well that clearly didn't work. So we need to stop doing that. Yeah. Um, but then you just start to build a lot more of that kind of that confidence. So then I kind of know how to maybe react to something. Um, a lot better depending on, um, um, you know, what, 
what the conditions are or sort of what the context is around some of that stuff. Um, and I also think that like why I've, I've liked doing kind of bursts. So I do this, you know, again, five years at a time, even startup Edmonton was five years. And then there's maybe another five, right? Like, because there's a beginning and then there's an end. And then there's a little bit of a goal to sort of like, can you sort of take it from here to here? And then, and then, you know, and can drop it or end it if it doesn't work and then move on to the next thing. Mm. I think each thing that I've been sort of involved is there, there's sort of like different layers that are there, but I really also like the challenge of the startup phase because in the startup phase, it's very much um, a lot of uncertainty. You got to keep people motivated. You got to figure out a bunch of these pieces. Um, And, but that's the, that's the best part to me is, is during that sort of phase when you're sort of building something from nothing. Um, And then to be able to do it in a way where I can kind of hand it off to somebody else and I'd love to see where some of these things have, you know, kind of kept growing, right? Or we get a space open and now someone else is running it. That's great. Like that's what you want to have happen kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think that, that just, that approach has just, you know, it just with each year, you just start to be like, okay, it's, it's been really part of that journey versus I did like the one thing, you know, and then are just known for that one thing. Um, and, you know, even with Startup Edmonton, I think when that was, when I sort of left that, like that was also a big part of like my identity. Right. And so then people only knew me for that, you know? So that's why I love being able to be like, yeah, we're working on this public thing because, you know, now I'm an entrepreneur again, trying to build something from scratch, just right alongside these other founders too. And that's, that's really exciting for me. So do you get bored easily? Is that, is that why you keep moving from thing to thing or is it just, I could say yes. Yeah. (laughs) Or, or is it just that you have this uh, curiosity and just this desire to learn? Yeah, I think, I think it's very much curiosity. Um, I think uh, I do, I do get bored, but you know, that's a strength. And it also sometimes like is, is totally weakness because I think, you know, I will always get, you know, in that sort of space of just like not, not being focused, too many things going on, you know, uh, or that didn't work or I got it start, you know, like some of those things. And, um, but you also start to accept that that's also part of maybe the superpower, right? Like, like yeah. I like that space because you can search again, see things where maybe nobody else sees. And now it's about the challenge of sort of like building something to sort of attack that, that, that problem. Um, but I'm also, I get a lot of value by just, working with other people to co-build stuff. Um, I've never, I think I've been lucky always to sort of have just really great teams or co-founders or like, you know, um, co-collaborators to be like, Hey, like we start something it often starts as like, Hey, let's do that. Sure. Let's do it. Right. And then, and then something happens and, you know, on the wall at startup Edmonton, like one of our big slogans was always like, don't wait, start now. Yeah. And I think for a lot of, you know, entrepreneur, like sometimes people will be like waiting for the best idea to become an entrepreneur Yeah. versus if you're just an entrepreneur, you're just an entrepreneur. You just, you build stuff, you get it going, you are able to rally other people around that. And then you are there to either see it work or not. And then you just kind of keep doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and that's really interesting uh, that you mentioned that just around kind of like the timing as to when to start something. And I've always said that as well as that uh, there is never going to be a better time than it is now, whatever time now is, because Holy if you keep delaying it and pushing it off, it becomes increasingly more difficult, I think, to get the, you know, the to to get beyond the inertia um the the more you delay it the more inertia sets in i think and so yeah you just have to have to get out there and do it and it's not necessarily going to be and this is the thing that you know i want our audience to also realize too is that what you think is going to be success is going to be like where the company ends up can be wildly different than where you thought it was going to be what you thought initially success needed to look like. Um, And actually speaking of that, what does success look like for you um, with what you have going on with the bug food hub and and the broader make space? What is success? And so I would say like from a, for me, success is, and it's great to be able to sort of see something that you built and people using it. I get a lot of value, like I get a lot of value yeah. from that. So I love, I love to hear that, like, you know, there's people that know startup Edmonton today, like they don't even know that I was involved in that. And I'm really excited about that because they're like, oh, you know, I went there, I did these pieces, or they came to, you know, one of the events that we've done, 
or they've been at one of our markets. Um, and I get real value out of that. Again, I think that that comes from being a teacher and educator. Because mm-hmm. when you think about the success of if you've helped somebody develop into something, and who's actually going to maybe grow into doing more stuff. And we had a hand in creating that environment for them. That's a huge win for me. Like to me, that that's a big sort of driver. Um, yeah. And I think the second one is just like, you know, that the, that the communities that I'm a part of, which are always evolving, are, are good in the sense of, you know, there's great values, really good people, people who are ambitious and trying to make stuff happen. And those are the circles that I always want to sort of stay within, whether it's, you know, hyper local here in Edmonton, or I'm a big, you know, always connecting into like global networks, because I just want to be around really just interesting people who are have diverse thinking. Yeah. Um, and so I, I see a lot of value and, you know, success when I can be part of those, um, those networks and those communities as well. What a great answer, you know, and, and so one of the things that um, I've always tried to instill in our culture at Ample Media is serve first. And uh, I believe very strongly that if you're serving other people, um, the good things are going to come. I don't know if it's a, you know, just karma, whatever you want to call it. Um, but also, I mean, that's really at the core of most businesses as you're trying to find some sort of solution to a problem or deliver a solution to a problem that a particular group of people or businesses are maybe having. And so you're serving them. And so if you really approach it from that serve first mentality, um, good things happen. And you have embodied that, I think, from day one. And it goes back to, I think, the teaching and what you were just saying in terms of, okay, well, how do I think about success? Success is about these people succeeding. Uh, if And if they're, you know, using and, and gathering and, and I have a, a small part to play in their their journey if i've served them in some form or another uh that's going to be success to me and so yeah like it's just i i hear that so strongly in what you're saying there so i i can really connect with that yeah so um I, a question for you because you brought your wife up uh, a minute ago there um just with regard to how she would describe you as maybe getting bored real quickly um you know if she were to describe you as a as an entrepreneur uh, as an individual how would she, her description of you be different than the description that maybe one of your co-founders uh one of your partners uh collaborators would uh would describe you what differences would there be there and and thinking where i'm going with this i guess just to be transparent ken is that um I, I think it's it's interesting the journeys that we take as entrepreneurs. We bring along, you know, our family, our loved ones, and so on, along with that journey. And it can be a real challenge. Entrepreneurship, as much as you and I, you know, are smiling at the events and excited about everything and really supporting the community, there's moments in our journeys that can be really stressful and stuff. And so entrepreneurship can be challenging. And I'm just curious from that perspective. How does uh, does does your wife, um, I guess, feel about it? How is the entrepreneurial life for you? How would she describe you that might be different than somebody else who's who's also really close to you? Yeah, no, that's a that's a good question. So um, my wife and I, she's also a teacher. Um, so we met in school at the university. Um, and so when I started my company, that was actually the first year. That's when we got married. So we married. 22 years now. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, we, we did in 2000. So then, you know, it was easy for me to sort of. <laughs> easy math. Goes back to uh, the math part. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, you know, I also sort of started that first company, um, you know, when she had just got a job, you know, we were living off a of first year teacher salary, we're sort of sort of figuring out like, you know, what are the, what are the, the values that we want to have and sort of what makes us sort of happy and sort of like always sort of creating, I think she would always sort of say, like, we don't actually talk about like all of the business sort of pieces, but she knows that um, what I'm doing is what I've kind of always been doing, which is building and bringing people together um, and, and getting a lot of uh, joy out of that aspect. Um, having a partner who is also, you know, very good at what she does in terms of like, you know, like she brings a lot of that to kind of her world too. And, um, and I think she has a lot of always doesn't understand necessarily what we're working on, 
because it's always like a new thing that's sort of happening, but there's that sort of like that constant sort of like theme of these sort of pieces that are there. Um, but at the end of the day, I always sort of tell us to founders when you're going through entrepreneurship is that you have to take care of home first. Yeah. Because if you, if you don't take care of home, you know, your family, your sort of baseline pieces, like that's always going to be the sort of foundation piece that really needs to be there. So then you can go off and go like a hundred and you know, 10% or more to go make other stuff happen, but you never want to put that at risk, you know? And so, so that's also a little bit of that sort of that balance of this, like, look, I'm not going to be reckless because I don't want to necessarily, um, that helps me manage my threshold around, you know, risk or what I'm willing to sort of get into. Um, or if you look at time, like there's time and is this the limiting factor that we all have. And so what it really becomes is just like, how do you use that time to go and, you know, do the things you want to be doing, the things that you should be doing, right? Um, and spending that and making sure that you have the time um, with the people that you want to be around to sort of support you. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, that's why we're building the things that we're building, right? Yeah. Is to try to find that time freedom, I think, at the end of the day, that's really uh, what drives me anyway. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs can relate to that. Uh, now, speaking of time, let's pretend that time is not a construct and that you have the ability to send a letter back to your younger self, the the self that was uh, maybe just starting uh, his uh, his entrepreneurial journey. So the Ken of 2000, I guess it would be. Uh, what would be in that letter? I was trying to think of... Uh... Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. You know, I think what I would tell my younger self then um, would be to probably stick with one thing a little bit longer. Um, I've, I've sort of figured out how to make multiple things work later on in my life. But, yep. you know, but I've always wanted to do lots of things all the time um, just because of eagerness kind of piece. Yep. Yep. And so I think in that, in those sort of early days, it would just be a little bit of like, you know, don't get so excited about all of the pieces right off the bat, see some of those things through. Cause then I think that that sort of results in, you know, um, things maybe working out faster, yep. right. Or figuring out some of those things faster as well. Yeah. And that's a really good point. And I can relate to that one as well, because I, again, it's that I, I can get distracted and I don't know if that's because of, of boredom, what we were talking about before, like just this desire to be uh, doing a lot of different things and the curiosity that I have and this eagerness to learn. And I'm just fascinated by all sorts of different types of uh, topics and subjects and technologies and, and, uh, you know, and just business models and so on, right? Like, there's just so many things I have a really broad interest. Uh, and so that is something that I've been cursed with as well, I think, in terms of if I could have focused earlier, um, instead of getting distracted by going on a few different uh, journeys and and probably over the last I, I don't know five six years I've been really doubling down on trying to just maintain that focus and not allow myself to be uh, distracted and I think uh, yeah that's uh, yeah indistractable as uh, I don't know if that's even a word but no uh, no well <laughs> and 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 I, the the flip side of that I would tell my younger self too is and this goes back to the courage piece which is also being like um like go after like go after it like and I think I think. Yeah. A lot of the opportunities that have kind of come my way or that I've found myself in over the years have just been, been from trying, you know, being present, uh, not judging a, a meeting or a connection, you know, like there's relationships yeah. that have sort of over time, new, old, they sort of like, you know, and, and are always sort of swirling there. And like, I always want to know, like, you know, what are you building? What are you working on? Right. And, and maybe there's something we work on right away maybe it's like 10 years later um but then those sort of networks that are out there too so i i think i think one of the things is is yeah don't overthink it but also have the courage to just like you know just be there um, yeah yeah 
Love it. Well, also on the topic of time, I mean, I could be talking to you for much longer, but we've already exhausted a lot of time here today. So thank you so much for your generous uh, donation of your time as we are trying to talk about entrepreneurship and hopefully our audience can uh, peel out, you know, one or two really cool pieces of uh, information, nuggets of knowledge that you've shared here today that might be able to propel them forward. If anybody wanted to connect with you, either uh, to find out more about the public a food hub to talk about make space to you know uh, just in general pick your brain because i know that you're a guy who loves to connect with people what's the best way to do that um yeah no i i um i i know that i'm not out at like lots of different events anymore or as much as i'd like to necessarily but i'm always up for you know a zoom or a chat or a, or an email i'm you know at, at ken at make space group dot com uh, or can at public food hub dot com. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm always, I'm always interested to sort of like meet interesting people. So yeah, because you never know, never know where the collaboration is going to be, right? And who that's going to going to be with. So yeah, really cool. And for those of you who are listening to this, head over to AmplifyYourBusiness.ca. That's where you're going to find all of our video archives. And of course, if you're listening only to this, uh, then you can find our back episodes as well. But just, just searching Amplify Your Business on your favorite podcasting platform. Until next time, everybody have a prosperous day.